for this for this evening. Um, so my name is Andrew Durand, and I work on Go um, with Rob. And um, tonight I wanted to introduce a uh, small demo app called Cuddle, which is an App Engine app um, written in Go. And um, Go came to App Engine in the first uh, or the second quarter of this year. Um, and in July, we announced it at Google I.O. And in July 2011, um, we and opened it up to the public. Um, it was previously available to trusted testers only. Um, and at present, um, all the major App Engine APIs are supported. There's still a few of them that aren't, uh, that are still in their sort of primordial phase, but we're, we're going for 100% support um, this year, hopefully. Um, and so in this, in this demo app, I'm going to talk to you, uh, I'm going to introduce parts of the data store, which is how to store structured data um, in, with App Engine, the channel API, which, which establishes a um, browser channel for pushing, pushing messages from App Engine services to web clients, um, and the Memcache API, API, which is pretty much essential for writing anything scalable on the web these days. So uh, I said Cuddle. What is Cuddle? It's a uh, cute name for a multi-user anonymous chat service. Um, so if you visit a URL like this one, and I'll do this now, showing my faith in our platform, um, you get this screen, um, which is slightly off the screen. But um, if, I, if I type in this box, hello, and it's optimized for mobile devices, um, so it looks much better on a phone. Um, the idea is, is that uh, we can, people can talk, and you can see it. It doesn't really matter who it is. Uh, typically, I could imagine a scenario where you're at a conference, and you say, hey, guys, the back channel for this talk is cuddle slash foobar. Everyone goes there and says, um, isn't Andrew terrible at giving talks? He should give up and go home. Um, not really. But this, uh, so it, when somebody, the mechanics of this are, is that when somebody visits a URL, cuddle slash something, um, it adds them to a room uh, named slash something. So in this case, gtug. Um, and then users can send messages to the room. And then the service um, rebroadcasts messages to all the members currently present in that cuddle. There's no persistent storage of messages. Um, they're purely ethereal. Um, so there's no backlog. Uh, and there's no way to identify who has said what, um, which is fine for a demo app. And maybe it would become some kind of viral thing. I'm accepting venture capital proposals. Um, you can see me afterwards. So um, how does it work? A little bit more technically. Um, so the path component compo uh, relates to a room record in the data store. So room is the, the name, um, capital R, room. And so each participant in a room has an associated client record, um, capital C. And so when a user loads that URL, um, our App Engine app queries the data store, looks for a room with that name, and if it doesn't exist, it creates it. Um, and then it generates a random ID for that user for that session, um, which would just be a random string of letters, um, 40 characters long. And then it creates a client record uh, under that name um, as a child of the room record. So the data store supports the notion of um, entities being related to each other. Uh, and when you have a, a, a parent entity and a, a, a set of child entities, that's considered an entity group. Um, and that becomes important when you start talking about um, data consistency. Um, but we won't actually encounter any of that in this session. Um, and then once they've joined the Cuddle, um, we create a browser channel for them with the channel API. Um, and that that uh, channel is identified by a client ID and a special token. Um, and then we write the user interface, which is a, just a blob of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, um, which if I go to my demo again, um, you can see it looks something like that. Um, it's just got all of it in one big blob. We write that out with the channel token so they can connect to the channel. Um, and the name of the group, and the JavaScript does all the rest. And so sending messages is simply a matter of, or sending and receiving, is simply a matter of receiving messages via the browser channel, and the JavaScript draws them to the page. And um, a client posts messages by hitting a handler, uh, a URL 
slash post, um, ah, passing in the uh, room name and the message body themselves. And so the server, um, on receiving a message like that, it looks up all clients who are children of GTUG and then sends a message to all of those clients using the channel API. Is everyone with me so far? Does that make sense? It's a very, very simple application, but if you don't, if this doesn't make sense, then I want to clarify now. Okay. So on the file system, the anatomy of a, a Go application looks something like this. Um, you have uh, the, the root, the app root, which is just some directory of whatever name. In this case, it's called Cuddle. Um, you have an app.yaml file. And so I forgot to ask this at the start, but who here has actually used App Engine before to build things? OK, that's cool. So you, you've probably seen an app.yaml file before, but it just contains the metadata that, that describes this application. Um, there's a, another Cuddle directory, and this time this is, the, this is the directory that contains the Go code inside package Cuddle. Um, and that's three files, um, some code to interact with the data store, some code to provide the HTTP handlers, and some code, a very small amount of code to handle the naming of rooms. And then finally, we have that, uh, the root.html, which is a template file um, in the template format that Rob showed, demonstrated the Lexer for before. Um, it only uses a small subset of the, of the Lexer's language, of the template package's language, but it does nonetheless. So this is what the app.yaml file looks like. Um, it's very simple. It just declares the application name, which is Cuddle Demo. Um, it's version one, it uses the Go runtime, and it uses API version two, which is the current version of the Go runtime. Um, and this is bound to increase over time. Um, but um, the key difference between this and, say, a Python app um, is that our in a Python app, you declare uh, paths that correspond to um, certain handlers in your Python script, or at least you can. Um, whereas in Go, you simply define the URLs paths that um, correspond to Go in general. And then you let the Go program itself handle the um, demultiplexing of requests to various HTTP handlers. So in this, in this case, we're saying um, the regex.star, um, which is everything after slash, um, is going to be served by the Go app, which is exactly what we want. Um, so Go, this is a, an example of a standalone Go program. So it's not an App Engine program. This is just a Go program that serves an HTTP server um, on port 8080 um, that simply writes hello and then whatever the URL path is. So if you go to slash Dave, it says hello, comma Dave. Hi, Dave. Um, and uh, this hello function is an HTTP handler. And all it does is write a string with fprint to w, which is the response. And uh, in the main function, we register that function hello with the path slash um, using this handle func um, function from the HTTP package. And then we call listen and serve to listen on port 8080 and run a web server. Um, but in App Engine, it's much the same. We use the HTTP package in the same way. Um, the key differences are is that instead of being in package main, you're in a package of some other name. In this case, it's hello. Go App Engine apps provide their own package main, um, which, is just, which means that you can't have your own one. Um, and so the other difference is that we use an init function to um, register our HTTP handler with, our, with the HTTP package. Um, in this standalone Go program, we have package main, um, but in our hello package, in our App Engine app, we use an init function. And these init functions are run before main. So um, that's how you do that. It's very straightforward. So our program Cuddle has two HTTP handlers. Um, it has a root handler, and that handles the joining part where the client joins a Cuddle. And uh, we add the client to the room and check for the room, and then create the channel, and then serve the HTML to the client. And then we have the post handler, which handles a request to post a message to a room. Um, and so the messages are returned to the user via the channel API. So in our init function, in our cuddle HTTP go, we have um, two handle func calls, one to register root with everything after slash, and one to register post with slash post. And so now diving straight into the code from the root handler. Um, 
the very first part of it, which is here, is um, it takes the name from the URL path component. It, it, we slice off. God, that's so annoying. We slice off the first uh, slash from the path because it will always be begin with a slash something. So if this was if r dot url dot path was slash gtug, um, this slice operation makes it simply the string gtug. And uh, we then pass name into a regular expression match. So valid name is a regex object, and match string uh, matches the name string against that regex. And so here in this separate code block, um, this is the global variable valid name, which I've created by calling regex, regex must compile. And it's simply a regex that matches all alphanumeric characters as well as dashes. Um, and so if it's not that name, or if it's an empty name, um, we'll get this if case, which ha serves an HTTP error using this error helper function. And we just say invalid cuddle name and tell you it's not found. Um, so continuing with the root handler code, um, we now want to call uh, this get room function, which is in the db.go file. And it gets or creates a new room um, with that name. And so this room is a value of type room, um, which is a struct that has one field. It has the room name. And that's all we know about a room. It just has a name, and that's it. Um, this line here, where we create the variable C, um, it's an app engine context. And to do any API calls in Go in app engine, you need to provide them with a context that is based on the current request. Um, so uh, this R refers to the um, R in the function arguments, which is an HTTP request. So we create a new app engine context from that request C, and then we pass that into our get room function, which uses it here to make an API call. So this is the body of the get room function. Uh, it's a pretty simple function. Um, it takes uh, the app engine context and a name, and it returns two parameters. Now, typically, you would have this bit of code at the end of the line, but I'm kind of constrained. Um, so I apologize for the sort of uh, crampedness of some of these examples. But at the top of this function, I create uh, a new room. And there should be a colon there. I apologize. I create a new room um, with the name that was provided. And, um, and then I make a call uh, to the data store, a get call. Um, and so I'm asking for a, um, a room record with the key that I'm providing um, and storing the result in this room that I've created. And you'll notice that I, I get the key by calling the method key on my room. And that method is defined here. Um, it's, a, it's a method key on a, on a point at a room that returns a data store key. And because often when I have a room, I want to, um, there's a few other examples where I need to get a key for a room. So I've made it a method on, on the room type. And all it does is call the new key function to create a key for that room with that name. Um, and so in the, back in the body of this function, I, I make that get call, and then I restore the, store the error return value in er. Now, if the er value is the, is the value from this data store package, no such entity, meaning that that room does not exist in the data store, I want to put a new, uh, a new record for that room in the data store. Because the, the definition of this function is that it fetches a room by name, and if it can't, it creates it, right? And so we, we execute a put and then store the error value in er, and then I return the room and that error value. So if there's an error has occurred, the caller can handle that error value um, further upstream. And it does, as we see on this slide. If, if, it's doesn't, if it fails, we handle the error. Um, but can anybody tell me what's wrong with this? Any, yeah? So I've got a race condition. Um, who, knows, who doesn't know what a race condition is? Cool. Um, so essentially, if I do a get and try and find a room with this key, and then I don't find it, and then another client comes in and is doing exactly the same thing, they both don't see one. One of them creates it, um, and then the other one doesn't see it. So what I need to do is instead do this in a transaction um, so that I can have a consistent state. And fortunately, to do that um, in Go, it's really straightforward. Um, because Go has um, just native support for functions as values, so closures as values. 
Um, so you'll see the, this is the core of my function here, the get and the put statements. I take that and I put that inside a new function definition, fn. So this is a variable, fn, which is a function that takes an app engine context and returns an error. And inside this function, all I do is do the get and the put uh, and return the error value. And then I can pass that function into this function, run in transaction. And so it just runs the contents of this. Uh, it just runs this, this closure um, inside a data store transaction. So it means that, um, it means that I, can't, uh, I can totally avoid that race. And so um, data store to run in transaction returns an error. And so here I'm returning the error return value of that and the room that I've just retrieved into this room variable. So back to our HTTP handler now. Now that I have a room, I want to add a client to that room, which is this the person who's joining the room. And I do this by calling the add client method on room. And I pass in a, um, a random ID, which is a, a, a little function that just generates a random alphanumeric string um, of client ID len um, characters long. And I pass in the context as well. And that returns a token. Um, and so this add client will create a new client record um, that's associated with that room. So this is the add client method. Um, and so the add client takes an ID, it creates a key that's a client um, with that ID. And then it, uh, and most importantly, this last field of new key is the parent key. And so I pass in the room key as the parent key for this client. And then when I uh, issue the data store put, um, putting this, this new client variable I've created in as a data store record, um, when it is stored, its key cor uh, describes itself as being a child of, um, of the room. And then I just, uh, it wants all that success. If it's not successful, I return the error. But if it is successful, then I call um, channel.create, which is accessing the channel API and creating a new browser channel that's associated with that client ID. And, um, and this channel.create, it returns a string and an error. And the string is the token we want to pass to the client. Um, and so finally, uh, in the, at the bottom of the root handler, we've got our room. And we've got our client um, in the room. And we've got our token to set up the browser channel. Um, we create this data variable which is a struct containing a room and a token string, just, just two string values. And that is the room name and um, the token val value. And then I call um, root temple.execute, um, passing in w, which is the HTTP response, and data, which is my template data. And um, this writes, this uh, template that I've passed as a global variable, it writes it out to the HTTP response. And so you get something like this. I showed you the, the, co the code from this before. Um, so the, the HTTP template looks like this. It has, um, an HTTP, it has the room name. It has the, um, the room name again, this time in JavaScript form, and the, the channel token. And if we look at the, um, the code that's actually generated, you see that the gtug name is there in heading. Um, the uh, gtug name there is, is under room, and this is the token that our channel API generates. And so um, quickly back to the, the template code itself. Um, in the JavaScript, and I don't want to sort of dwell on the JavaScript very much, but the JavaScript creates um, the, the browser channel using this um, function call, or this creating this new object, passing in the token. And then we call chan.open on that new object and um, set an on message handler that simply um, adds new messages to this um, log div every time a new message comes in on that channel. And so this is, this is a piece of uh, infrastructure that's provided by the, the um, App Engine channel API. And it's a really flexible and nice way of just very easily setting up a, a back channel back to the client. So does that, are there any questions about any of that? So that's, that's the entire thing end to end for actually um, joining a room and creating the browser channel. And so now we're ready, to, um, we're ready to receive messages. And the final missing part of the puzzle is posting messages to the channel. And so posting messages is basically just the reverse. 
Um, we have this post handler, which you saw I registered with the HTTP package a while ago. Um, and we just get the room again using the same get room function that we had. Um, and then we call this send method to send um, this value. So form value is a method on request that pulls um, get or post variables from an HTTP request. Um, so I want to pull the message um, get variable from our request um, and send that out to all of the clients who are participating in a room. And so what does a what does this, the send method look like? Um, it's quite straightforward. We have at the top of it um, we have a, a query. So we set up a client's slice, which is like an array, um, and we run this query against client records that have an ancestor that is a parent that is um, the room. So we're looking for all of the client records that are children of the room. And then we use the get all method to execute that query. And then that's, that stores all of the clients in the client slice. And then we can iterate through the client slice. And for each one of those, we do a channel send call. And we send um, identifying the channel by its client ID and send the message to that client. So this iterates through and sends that message to every client that is currently connected via a channel. Um, if it encounters an error, instead of returning the error to the user and telling them their post was unsuccessful, instead um, I just um, call the error f method on the app engine context, and that actually writes an error message to the admin console in app engine. So I can log into the admin console and see if um, there's something wrong with the app engine infrastructure or see if for some reason my messages aren't being sent correctly to clients. But if a particular client doesn't receive a message, that's not really an error that I should concern my end user with. It's more of a programming issue. So can anybody tell me something that might be not wrong but just bad about this? What I'm doing here. Every time I'm sending a message, I'm doing a data store query um, I've just said what it is, but yeah. It's like totally inefficient to any time some, like if people are sitting there chatting, you don't want to just be querying for exactly the same data every time. As long as nobody's joined this chat, this, the result of this query is always going to be the same. So um, enter the memcache, um, the memcache API. So at the top of my function now, um, I do this memcache get, and I'm using the room name as the cache key, because it's just, the room name is as good as anything. Um, and then I'm, re I'm getting uh, the, the participants of that room as a, as a JSON blob um, out of memcache. Um, and if there's an error, I return that error. But if there's a cache miss, meaning that this data is has either fallen out of memcache or it wasn't there in the first place, I want to do my um, data store query as before. So I've just omitted those lines here for brevity. But then once I've gotten that data from the data store, I'll do a JSON set um, to set that memcache item um, so that the next time this send method is called for this room, that data will be found and we don't need to do the data store query again. Uh, and then we send the messages just as we did before um, and, and continue on. Um, and so there's one other piece of the caching puzzle that is left. And that is, any time a new client enters the room, we need to invalidate that cache record. We need to delete it out of memcache because the client list that's cached is no longer true, uh, no, no longer reflects the reality. So after we've put the client into the data store in the add client method, um, we just do a simple call to memcache delete to delete a memcache record with that name. Uh, and that just invalidates the cache. And then we can go on to create the channel. Um, and so that's it. That's the entire thing. Um, I've just uh, yeah burned through that. So um, the the entire code for this and the talk itself is all available at this URL. So you're free to peruse uh, at your leisure. There's a couple of things that I omitted, um, like the entire structure of the of the Go files that you might find um, interesting or edifying. And you could certainly a nice project to hack on if you wanted to get started with something in the multi-user kind of interaction way. Like you could easily extend this um, to be some kind of game or something. Um, like a tic-tac-toe or a board game or something. Um, but yeah, the App Engine project for Go is uh, pretty well documented at this address. Um, again, like Rob said, there's the Golang website, which has a huge amount of resources, including tutorials and code walks. 
And the Go blog has a huge wealth of um, articles about Go. There's articles about profiling Go programs if you're interested in performance. Um, there's articles about particular Go idioms, about error handling, about using particular data structures, and all these kinds of things. So I thoroughly recommend, if you're interested in Go, to check out the blog. Um, it's can't sell it enough. It's really worth checking out. Um, but does anybody have any questions? Yes. Great, grab the mic. Can you just explain that what the underscores were in the source code, Andrew? Underscores, sure. So in places like this, um, in Go code, you might see an underscore and in assignments. Um, and what that means is that data sort of put returns multiple return values. Um, data sort of put actually returns a key um, and an error value because it's possible to put what's known as an incomplete key, that is, a key that doesn't actually have a unique identifier in it. And then when, once you've put it in the data store, it's actually filled out and becomes a complete key, and you can use that to get data back out again. So in this case, um, I don't care about that key because I've already given it a complete key. Um, and I don't want to assign it to some temporary variable called like temp key or something. Um, instead, I just want to throw the value away. Um, and so I use the underscore. And the underscore is also kind of known as the write-only variable in Go. And, and one reason why this is really important, aside from keeping your code nice and neat, is that in Go it's illegal to declare a, a variable that you don't then use. So if I declared some temporary variable t, I would have to find some artificial way of using it or the compiler would complain to me about it. Um, so it's actually a really nice way of keeping... It's, an, it's a nice rule because it means that you keep your Go code very clean and don't leave remnants of things lying around. But yeah, big fan of the underscore. Um, other questions? I'm happy to answer any questions, not just about this, but about Go in general. Um, yeah? Is there anything you wouldn't recommend you use Go for? Like any sort of application? Sure. Um, so one area which is a little bit wanting at the moment is um, there's no GUI toolkits like for native apps, um, n like not web apps, that I really like. I know there are bindings for things like GTK. Um, there are bindings for the Windows, um, whatever that's called. I'm not a Windows programmer, so I'm not sure. But there are, there are bindings for a few, a few different GUI toolkits, but none of them are particularly um, idiomatically designed, they all kind of are basically a thin shim onto a C API, um, which is not a, a very fun way of writing Go code. And so I, when people say they want to write some rich GUI app, I say it's probably better to write the fun part of it in Go and then the UI part of it in either in the browser or um, use like an RPC connection to say, I don't know, whatever your favorite kind of uh, languages for doing that kind of UI work. But that's, that's definitely um, the broadest, it's, it's one of the hardest things to design really well. And so most UI kits, aren't, toolkits aren't designed very well. Um, and even those that are, are not written for Go. So it doesn't sort of mesh as well as it could. But Go is really useful for a really broad range of things. So that's a, that's a good question. Are there any questions from the, the chat? Did anybody see that? No? Nobody's been watching? Oh, you answer them in the chat. Stealing my thunder. <laughs> All right, yeah? I know, I, I know that um, from just from playing with it a bit, you can't have a, a function, well, you can't have a, a function and a variable with the same name. Um, you, you, can't have, you can't have name conflicts between um, is it methods and variables or, or, or variables in, in structs. Can you can you can you treat them can you treat them the same? I, I don't I don't remember. Okay. Like if you've got an X, does it does it matter if it's an X that is a method with no arguments or an X that is a um, a variable of a struct? Can you call them the same? There are a couple of things packed into that question. Um, the first one is that it's illegal to declare two names at the same scope level in Go. So if you have 
in a function, you can't declare the variable x twice at the same scope level. If you, once, you, once you're sort of nested in a block, um, you can shadow the outer x with your inner x. Um, but once you, once you go to the package global level, which is where we define things like global variables, constants, types, um, and functions, of course, um, and methods, which are just a type of function. If you, um, the example you're giving is, say, you have a type definition which has a struct with a field x, and then it also has a method with the name x. You can't do that because they're both, um, they both effectively exist at the same level, um, and you address them in the same way. If you have a struct foo, dot x is either its field x or its method x, so you can't have both. Yeah, yeah, but it has to be with to, for it to be a, to be a call. It has to have x open close parent. Uh, but you can't you can't with a method. You can't take the you can't pass around a method because that would be currying the the object that's associated associated with with the function. And there's no currying doesn't exist in Go. So that's a pretty sort of deep question. Um, which probably doesn't interest a lot of people, but I'm happy to have answered it. Does anybody have any other questions? That it's fine for them to be those times, types of questions. I'm just reassuring people. <laughs> uh, what's the performance of the Go app engine platform compared to Python or Java? Um, Go, uh, David, stop talking and listen to the question and therefore have some input to help me with the, with the answer. Um, the, the question was, um, David works on Go for App Engine. That's why I bother him. Um, but the the question was, well, what's the performance of the Go App Engine runtime compared to Python and Java? And the answer is it's actually very good um, because um, Go is a compiled language. Um, Go apps tend to start up very fast. Um, so if your app comes under a lot of load, it's very easy for the App Engine's app servers to fire up a whole lot of instances of your app, and they start performing really, really quickly. Um, Python's not too bad in this respect either. Um, it's not as fast as Go, but Java, on the other hand, um, a sizable Java app can take a, quite a long time, on the order of minutes on, in some occasions, to actually um, spin up and start serving um, effectively, whereas Go goes from basically zero to full throttle in under a second in most cases. So that's really nice. Um, as far as code execution goes, it's far and away the fastest um, language for App Engine at the moment. Um, J um, Java can compete with it on, in some tasks. Um, but it absolutely blows Python out of the water. If you have anything CPU intensive to do and you want to do it on App Engine, Go is totally the language to do it in. Um, and in fact, I would say if you have anything CPU intensive to do full stop, I think Go is a pretty great language to do it in. Um, but yeah, it definitely applies to App Engine. Do you have anything you wanted to add to that? Or oh, Cool. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure you were listening, that's all. Other questions? I'll just to give an example. One of the things we um, one of the our t early test programs, what was it, Mandelbrot tiles to appspot.com, was this, um, uh-oh, yeah, you better fix it. Anyway, it's a, it's a, a, a server-side generated Mandelbrot example, and it's, it's in the SDK, you can check it out, um, but it, yeah, it runs pretty fast. Oh yeah, that, that too as well. Um, I think in, um, and total disclaimer here, I'm not on the App Engine team. I don't know um, what the exact real story is, but I believe we will be charging in a more fine-grained way for resource usage um, on App Engine. And so I believe that Go definitely has a big advantage in terms of CPU time and memory use um, over, over Python and Java. Yeah, good. Thanks for coming. Sure. Do you want me to, I can do one from scratch, perhaps. Um, okay. <laughs> can you do something really, really hard? No. <laughs> yep. Sure. Okay. I'll I'll show a couple of things. Oh, so I'll show you first. I'll show you this. What I meant to show you.
So this is uh, all being generated in some data center somewhere in uh, a long, long way away from here. Um, so any sort of delay you see here is probably due to network latency. Also, I'm over Wi-Fi, so that probably doesn't help. Um, but this is when we launched. Um, you know, we started pimping this this uh, link out on Twitter and stuff, and we had like a lot of people um, hammering it pretty hard, and it was it was uh, it was very nice to see how well it performed. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we get we get stats on on um, how many of the tiles that were loaded were in memcache and how many were generated on the fly, and you can see that. Um, oh, if I read if I reload the page, oh, there you go. Uh huh. So a bit over like one and a third of them were hits then, um, or whatever. Sorry, it's getting late. Um, so I'll show you, I'll just quickly show you a run through of, of Hello World. So the first thing I do is go to code.google.com slash app engine slash downloads. Of course, you can just search for app engine downloads and you'll get to the same place. Um, you go to the app engine SDK for Go, and then you download the, uh, the whichever one matches your system. And if you're looking there and wondering where Windows is, that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, we don't support um, app engine for Windows. Um, because Go support for Windows, while it is there and it works, it's not 100% um, supported in the same way that we support um, Darwin, Linux, and some of the other platforms. Um, but it is it is on the roadmap. It is going to happen. It's a matter of when, and we hope when will be soon. But I can't make any timeline promises. Um, but the uh, so I download that, and it's already downloaded somewhere, and unzip it to somewhere, and then you get. Um, <coughs> You get Google App. You get a Google App Engine folder somewhere. Can't full screen that. Hang on. Oh, is that off the screen? There you go. Okay. So this is the contents. Um, there's a demos folder, and it has a bunch of demo apps. Um, the Hello World app is um, is in there under demos Hello World. It has an app YAML file that looks very almost identical to the one that I showed you before. So what should add to that? Is that just a placeholder? Well, if you look at a Python one, um, so if I, if I say Python app YAML, um, you'll see there's, there's other directives. So uh, in Python, you say script is home.py, and then it, it uses home.py to serve that. Um, that particular path, um, but in Go, uh, like I said at the start of the talk, um, it's either handled by the running Go app or it's not. Um, and so in this case, it's just with a slash. So my Hello World program is in the Hello World directory. So the path I'm in is demos Hello World Hello World, and there's Hello World Go, which is in package Hello World, um, which is just a um, an init function which registers my handler with um, the HTTP package and the handler itself, which says hello world. Um, and then to deploy this, um, what I would do is uh, go to the app engine um, developer console. And then uh, see you can see my cuddle demo is there. Um, and then I would uh, create a new app, and I would call it Hello World. But of course, that is taken. So I'd have to call it something else. Um, but I'm not actually going to create one um, right now, and I'm not actually going to update it. Um, but what, what I would do then is um, edit my app YAML to say whatever the name of that app I just created was. Because if Hello World's taken, I'd call it like Andrew Hello GTUG or something, um, and put that there. And then I would run uh, the app CFG updater. And there's all docs on how to do this as well in the getting started guide for App Engine. I would just say update um, from this directory. And uh, it gets all the files together, contacts the server, asks me for my login credentials, 
Um, and because I use two-factor authentication, which everybody should, um, I need to create an app-specific password for my App Engine account. And I'm not going to log into like my admin interface and show you all my passwords and all this kind of stuff. So that's why I'm not going to log in and do it. But otherwise, I would type Andrew DG, which is my Gmail, email me, hello, um, and put in that one-time password. And then, uh, and then it would update to the server, and then the service would go live. And that would be it. Um, and it's that straightforward. So that's Hello World. The other question was, what happens if you want to have like multiple packages and things in a Go program? Sorry, that Hello World, um, does, the, does the directory name also have Hello World? No. Um, so this is called Hello World, and there's a Hello World directory inside it, which has a Hello World Go package. And so a package is like a unit of code in Go. Um, it doesn't have to be called Hello World. It could be called anything. Uh, I don't think they do have to be the same. I think it's it's um, the convention is for them to be the same, but they don't have to be. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So sorry. This is totally the best thing I could be demoing. <laughs> right. So I can run the dev app server, which anybody who's done Python apps knows what the dev app server is. Um, I run the dev app server locally, and that this is a virtual, uh, uh, no, a, uh, a local instance of the, um, the remote app server. So when I visit this localhost link in my browser, I see hello world and um, some Unicode characters to make sure that Unicode works. Um, and that's Korean, is it? Yep. So just a question on, on Unicode. Hang on, I'm not finished. Sorry. And so the really nice thing. <laughs> The really nice thing about this is um, when I go to uh, demos hello world, hello world, and then edit that file. So Go is a compiled language, as Rob mentioned. It compiles to machine code. And so when I loaded this page, if I look at this uh, log, it says um, building Go app, running Go app. So when I, when I loaded that page, it actually built and ran the Go program. If I change the, um, the code in here, um, the uh, the dev app server will notice and um, will rebuild the code accordingly. So if I change this to say hello gtug like that and then uh, refresh it rebuilds and re-executes it and serves the page. So that gives you an idea of how quickly Go builds as well. Um, so you get that very same feeling that you get developing web apps in a scripting language in Go for App Engine because we have this automagical recompilation system, which is a, just a really nice way of writing Go code. Um, and so that's that's a single package program, um, but which is what I also demonstrated with Cuddle before. But if you want to have a, a package with multiple program, uh, sorry, a Go app with multiple Go packages. Um, which is a very common thing to want to do. Um, I have, uh, say, this app, uh, Mustachio, which I demonstrated at Google I.O. Um, this is the root directory, the app root of Mustachio. It has a number of directories in it. Um, it has the uh, Mustachio directory, which is the Mustachio main app code, which is like the handlers and everything. It has a uh, resize package, which has some image resizing code in it. It has a um, free type Go. Um, package, which is a third-party package that uh, Nigel over there wrote for rendering text, and I use it for drawing a moustache on an image. Um, and the GoAuth2 package, which is an OAuth implementation in Go. And so inside my, uh, inside those directories uh, is Go code. And um, the resize size one belongs to package resize, the moustache one belongs to package moustachio. And if I look at my uh, moustachio slash uh, draw, draw.go, you'll see it imports uh, the free type Go package. So this is, this is a, a local dependency. And these, these two here, xdraw and image, are, um, are standard library packages. And in my um, mustachio slash HTTP package, um, I, have, I import GoAuth2. And I also should be importing resize. I don't know where that went. Um, Oh yeah, so down, it's down here. The separate import. So um, you import resize, and that's the the image resizing code. So the 
all of this Go code uh, when you run the Dev App Server or when you deploy to um, Google servers is all just automatically built into its packages and then linked into a single executable. And then all of the various init statements, init functions that, that um, register HTTP handlers, they all start before the main app begins. And so you can have multiple different Go apps that are all built into the same server as long as they don't clobber each other's um, uh, HTTP paths, they'll be fine. So you can actually very easily, in the same way you can with Python, have multiple um, apps coexisting in the same logical app, oh, sorry, multiple logical apps coexisting in the same sort of physical app. Um, you can do the same thing with Go with have multiple packages that are effectively multiple logical apps living in the same um, binary or the same Go app. Does that answer your question? So the rules for which files compile um, is being restricted all the time. <laughs> At the moment, uh, I think we exclude things. It only looks for things that end in .go. Um, and then we exclude things that end in underscore test.go, which are typically test files. Yeah. So um, I'll get to that. But we don't currently support an app CFG ignore, do we, yet? Oh. OK, and there is also an app YAML directory you can use to specify a path which has no um, go, which, which shouldn't be built. Um, and so the app builder won't crawl that path if you have a no build files directi directive in your app YAML. Um, as far as testing, um, Go has a really great testing framework called Go Test. Um, it lets you write uh, tests that are really, um, really simple, um, they're just written in Go, there's no kind of meta language there, it's all very lightweight and straightforward. Um, but part of the convention there is to use underscore test.go files. We want to bring the same thing to App Engine, or at least something very close, um, but it's on the roadmap, but it's not something that we've done, done yet. But, uh, I mean, um, there is, a, so as far as testing goes, um, we have, the way we figured we'd make testing in Go work really well is by making it really, really easy to write tests. Um, and the, the simplest way of doing that is getting them to write them in Go. Um, and the way um, testing works in Go is we have this program called Go Test. Um, and I'll see if I can look at a simple one from the standard library. So if we look at, say, the, um, the zip package, um, where we have uh, a... Uh, this bunch of files, if you ignore, I'll just, oops. Um, we have the go files, and then we have these underscore test.go files. And so when you build this package um, for, d for production, it just builds only the, the .go files, not the test files. But when you run go test, um, it actually builds all of those um, files together and then it provides a, an artificial main um, function that uh, calls special functions. So the special functions in this case are anything that begins with um, the word capital T test. So this function test reader um, iterates over my range of reader tests, which is just more Go data structures, um, and then um, tests the actual code that is in the zip package. So I'm actually inside my zip package. So I can access all the internals of the package um, as well as the external interface. And so you can write tests that test all aspects of your, of your code as if they're written in there right alongside um, the code itself. But they don't get built into the final product. Um, but so yeah, so that's, that's, that's essentially go test in a nutshell. Um, and uh, that's a very long test. So if you do test.short, um, it skips the really long ones. And you'll see that all my tests pass, which is nice. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's kind of an integral thing. It's part of the Go philosophy to be really lightweight like that. Um, we do have a code coverage tool. Um, I think it's broken at the moment. Um, it used to work. Uh, the things change in the compiler and everything, and the linker, and um, things kind of fall out of sync. But it's definitely um, on the agenda to, to make that work again soon. 
So yeah, it almost works on Linux at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll just quickly say a, a couple more things um, about uh, where is it? Sorry, no. No, it's gone. Um, so, in addition to Go test, we also have Go doc, which is like PyDoc for documentation. It pulls documentation right out of source code, um, and that makes it very easy to keep your docs and your code in sync. Um, so, if we look at, if I'll just quickly show you in the, if I do Go doc archive slash zip, um, you'll see there's all this documentation about um, the zip file package. And so, if I look at this thing, for, for example, the documentation for open, the open method returns a blah, 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 blah. If I actually look at the uh, reader code and look for open, you'll see that that is the actual comment on that on that function. And uh, going another step further, if I go to golang.org slash package slash archive slash zip and go to open, uh, the same docs are all presented there. So it's all like totally consistent in that sense. Um, and so we, we also have... Uh, Go install, which is a, a remote package installation utility, and it's also good for building packages locally without having to write make files, um, which is always nice. Um, we have a tool called Go Fix, which is uh, you can use to update Go code um, between releases of Go. So we issue releases every one or two months, and occasionally APIs are changed, um, and we have Go Fix, which automatically rewrites your code to use the new APIs. Um, so that you don't have to fumble around um, changing things. And a really nice side effect of that is that it enables us to make um, far-reaching um, API changes um, to make the APIs better without having to burden people with the, 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 um, the task of updating their code. And so we're not burdened with backward compatibility at this stage, which is a, a nice thing. Are there any big Go something tools I'm forgetting? Format. Oh, yeah, Go format. Um, so, if you run all Go code, uh, all Go code that's in the Go repository is run through this tool called GoFumpt, G-O-F-M-T, um, and it formats Go code to make it look pretty um, by some definition of pretty. And it works really well. It means nobody argues over white space. Um, it's very, it's, uh, it eliminates all that, that myriad conversations. Oh, can you please put your brace on the next line? That, that kind of thing. It's just not an issue. And working in a team environment, it means that all Go code looks the same, and as a result, Go code is, tends to be very readable, or at least more readable than a lot of code I've seen. Um, there is a there is a mocking framework um, that I believe might be open sourced soon. Um, there are some other um, open source testing um, tools, but I haven't used them, so I don't know. But the, oh, there is the um, if you go to the Go package dashboard, um, this lists package installations, third, like external package installations. Um, and it also reports on their build status. Um, and there's also uh, a projects page which lists, um, this is my administrative one with the admin interface showing. How embarrassing. Um, oh no. Oh it's, oh, it's logged me out of everything. I w forgot why I didn't do that. <laughs> you see, the, the thing is changing. Google.com, Google.com.au, YouTube.com, everything, all gone. And I was signed into three accounts as well. Oh! <laughs> I got a Chinese one. <laughs> that's great. OK. Oh, and that's the corporate one. Go on. That's what you Yep. <laughs> that would have worked just as well. Anyway. So that's the projects page. Um, <laughs> it shows you there's a whole lot of stuff on there, um, a lot of different things. So definitely worth checking out if you're wondering. Um, so that's go dashboard at appspot.com or um, more easily accessible um, if you go to the package dashboard there on at golang.org. What time is it? 8.23. Anybody got any other questions? Uh, yep. Database support. Database support. Um, we have, what sort of database do you like? Oracle. 
don't ask for Oracle first. We don't have, there's not an Oracle database driver. There are um, MySQL, Postgres, um, Mongo, uh, Couch, DB, other ones along those lines. Um, one really nice thing that we heard about, um, so this is database related stuff, um, Redis, SQLite, all that kind of stuff. But one really nice thing we heard about this one in particular, MGO um, or Mango, is, is uh, it's a uh, MongoDB driver for, uh, for Go written by a guy called Gustav Gustavo Niemeyer. And this quote here is from one of the MongoDB guys, one of the main guys, and he's saying MGO might maybe be the most advanced MongoDB driver right now. Um, so yeah, if you use MongoDB, apparently you should be using Go as well. Um, but you know that's a that's a nice thing to know. So it's not just that we have the support; we also have quite rich support in areas. Of course, it's not like uniformly rich. There's some that are better better than others, um, but it's definitely like way more mature than it was when we launched 18 months ago. And it's really gratifying to see people building nice idiomatic interfaces to popular applications. But yeah, if somebody knows somebody at Oracle that doesn't hate Google, um, you could. <laughs> Could get them to write one, sure. Um, if you wanted to get started contributing to Go, you would click on the contributing link. That's a good place to start, and then go to the contributing code page, and where we have a uh, a small diatribe on how to uh, get started with code review and um, the code contribution process. Um, definitely better to get started writing your own stuff first. Um, it's a bit of a, it's a, like Go, writing Go code is different to writing code in other languages um, in that we don't have like the typical ideas of object hierarchies and inheritance and, and a lot of other things that you take for granted in other languages. So it takes a little while for you to kind of uh, unlearn a lot of these things and, and start producing really idiomatic Go code, which is the kind of code that we put in the, the core project. Um, but it's, the barrier to entry is really, really low in terms of, um, Accessibility. Um, if you've got the code, we'll take it. Um, it's licensed under a BSD license. You still retain the copyright as one of the Go authors, um, but it's freely distributable um, under the terms of that license. And uh, uh, we have almost 200 non Google external contributors to date, and a good 20 odd of them would be active on a one week kind of basis. And we have two non-Google committers as well. Um, so people who actually can commit code um, without us having, well, every, everything's code reviewed. So that's a really great thing. It's a high quality of code, but they can actually commit code without us having to do it for them. Anybody else? Uh, just while I was saying about the community thing, um, there's a great community of developers. There's also a great community of Go users. And we have a very active mailing list called Golang Nuts and an active IRC channel, which you can see over there, um, called Go Nuts. Um, it's more active in the United States um, and European daylight hours, um, but it's still pretty active even in our time zone. And um, if you have Go questions, taking it to either Golang Nuts or to um, the IRC channel is a great way to get an answer that's accurate and quickly. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you want to get into Go, definitely lean on those resources. Don't uh, Searching the mailing list before posting is always a good idea. Um, I'll definitely say that. But don't, you know, don't be afraid to post. I guarantee you somebody much stupider than you has probably posted before. Um, so you can't look too bad. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? Cool. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I don't know if the GTUG guys have further things they want to talk about.